Hello, I'm Tashan, and this is Legacy Liner. Welcome aboard. What if I told you that you survived the most infamous maritime disaster in history? And then when you finally get home and then is allowed to be with your family and your loved ones again in your home country, instead of being recognized as a survivor, you were villainized as being a coward. Well, that is what happened with the only Japanese passenger on board the Titanic. And today, we're going to dig deeper into his story. So, without any further delay, we're going to dig into the story of Masabumi Hosono, Titanic's only Japanese passenger. Hosono was born October 15, 1870 which would have made him about 41 at the time that he was on board the Titanic. He was born in a village of Hokura, which is now part of Yoitsu? Yoitsu? I don't feel like I'm pronouncing these names right, but if you know how to pronounce them, let me know in the comments. In 1896, he graduated from the Tokyo Higher Commercial School, and after that, he joined the Mitsubishi Joint Stock Company. About a year later, he left the company to work as a cargo clerk, for a freight terminal in Tokyo. In 1906, he decided to go back to school again to take some classes and learn how to speak Russian. The school he went to is now the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. He ended up becoming a manager in accounting and investigating division of the Imperial Railroad Office, and a year later, he became a railroad director. In 1910, it was time for him to put his recently new skills of learning how to speak Russian to use, and he was sent over to Russia to research the Russian state railway system. So as you can see, he was definitely a man that was constantly elevating in his career. He seemed to be very smart and well-educated. He was fluent in three languages, Japanese, Russian, and English. And he also went to all these different schools and got all of this different education. So he definitely was someone who was very well educated and elevating through a very good career. This was a man who clearly took pride in his work. After a couple of years of researching the Russian state railway system, it was time for him to head back home to Japan. In the process of doing this, he ended up stopping in London for a little bit. So he got to tour around, see the different parts of London, and then he headed to Southampton, where on April the 10th, 1912, he boarded the Titanic as a second-class passenger. Now, we actually do know a lot about his final day on the ship, April the 14th, because it just so happened that at this time, he was writing a letter to his wife about what he did that day. And it actually is on a piece of stationery that has like the Titanic uh, logo and header at the top of it for the White Star Line. So in this letter, he talks about how on the morning of April the 14th, that Sunday, he woke up around seven o'clock that morning. And then about an hour later at eight, he went to breakfast. He got some exercise walking around the ship. He read a book. He had lunch at two and then dinner at six. He laid around his cabin a little bit, read before falling asleep. And that was pretty much the gist of his day. He just had a very relaxed, laid back Sunday. Vacations were not a very common thing back in those days. You know, you didn't get like the PTO time and stuff like we do today. So when you were commuting on an ocean liner, by all means, that was your chance to kind of kick your feet up, relax and smell the coffee, if you will. <laughs> but as we already know, his relaxing, chilled Sunday was about to take a very dark turn. At 11.40 that night, while he was fast asleep, he felt a bump. He said it felt like the ship had hit something. Now, you would think that this would make you kind of hop out of bed, but with him, it was a bump where he was like, uh, we must have hit something. And then he went back to sleep. He wasn't even really thinking about it. And then he also noticed that not long after he felt that bump, he felt the ship's engines stop. Like he heard the engines cut off. He didn't kind of feel those vibrations or anything anymore from the ship going. And even though he noticed it, once again, he went back to sleep. He didn't really think much of it. It wasn't until he heard a loud knock at his door from one of the cabin stewards that he knew something must be wrong. Whenever this cabin steward knocked on the door and, you know, told him to get up to the upper decks, 
he tried to go catch the steward so he could find out what happened. But whenever he tried to stop the steward to see what happened, he didn't get any answer. So at this point, he kind of knows something must be wrong. So he nervously and, you know, hastily gets dressed. And in the process of doing this, he can't find his white shirt, nor can he find his collar for the shirt. Now, I didn't really think that this was a major detail when I was reading through this, but um, I guess that did play a little part in it later on in the story. Because what ends up happening is once he gets dressed and he leaves his cabin, he looks for a steward again so that he can find out what is going on. You know, he felt these bumps, the engine stopped, they're waking him up in the middle of the night. He wants answers, rightfully so. And when he finds a steward to try to ask him, the steward tells him that he needs to go downstairs to the third class section of the ship. This steward looked at him and I guess he saw an Asian man that didn't have the proper dress on and just immediately assumed, oh, this is some third class passenger that snuck up into the second class area and he needs to get back down to his own section while we get all of this sorted out. And so Hasono did talk to him and explain to him that he was in fact a second class passenger and he was in his proper section of the ship. And afterwards, he decided to go back to his cabin. When he went to his cabin, he grabbed his blanket. He left his glasses, he left his purse, he left his money, all of that behind. The only thing extra that he grabbed was a blanket to wrap himself up in. Once he got this blanket and decided that he was going to go up to the upper decks like what they were supposed to do, he was stopped by yet another member of the ship's crew and told, what are you doing here? You need to get back down below. And so I guess, once again, this was a crew member that assumed he must have been a third class passenger. And Hasano was getting ready to, you know, do as he was told. But he looked and he noticed, like, nobody else is going deeper down into the ship. Everybody else is going up. So why is he telling me that I have to be the one person to go down? Once again, he's a very educated, intelligent man. So he just decides that he's not going to listen to it. You know, I'm not going to go down into a ship that might be sinking. That's not a very wise decision. And on top of that, he had a second class ticket and they just kept trying to make it feel like he wasn't in the section that he was supposed to be in. So he did not listen to what he was told and he kept going to the upper decks. As he got to the upper decks, he did take note of a few things. He noticed that the ship was shooting up distress rockets. He saw, you know, the rockets go up and they would blast into this blue signal. And then he said that there was a loud noise that came from them, you know, the bang of the distress rockets going off. And he said that whenever this happened, there was a calm silence that fell over everyone on the deck as they saw these distress rockets being shot off. And according to his accounts, he saw the first few boats being lowered with only women and children in them. He did see that there was a large crowd of men, but the crew members were blocking the men off from getting access to the boats. And they were doing so with what he called short rifles. I don't know if that's another name for like the type of guns that the officers had, but that's what he said he saw them with. He also, at this time, began to notice that the Titanic was beginning to tilt very heavily. So, you know, he's put all two and two together. The ship is really in distress. They're shooting off rockets. The ship is at an angle. I felt that bump earlier in the night. Because, mind you, none of the crew members have clearly explained to him even what was going on yet. And Hasano was standing there on the boat deck, and he was thinking about his wife, and his children, he had four kids, and he was just thinking how he was never going to see them again. And at that moment, an officer shouted out, I have room for two more. And at that moment, as soon as he processed what he heard, he saw a man run and jump into the boat. Well, that was one of those spots. So Hasano saw this and was like, this is my chance. This is probably my only chance I'm going to get. And so he himself went and took the second spot. And the boat was lowered off into the water, and sure enough, they slowly but surely rowed away from the Titanic, 
as she sank deeper and deeper into the dark North Atlantic waters. He did mention how as they were rowing away at one point, the screams on the ship got louder and louder and more intense. It was almost as if at that point, that's whenever the passengers and crew that were left behind fully realized and processed that they no longer had anywhere to go. All of the lifeboats have now left the ship. Hasono also describes the sound of the Titanic as she sank. He said that the ship made an awful noise as it sank beneath the sea. And like so many other survivors, the thing that really stuck out to him was the screams of the people as they were left in the ocean after the Titanic sank beneath them. Those desperate cries and pleas for help. And he said that in his lifeboat, the women and the children began to cry because that must have been the point when the reality set in that their husbands and fathers that were left behind were the very screams that they were hearing calling out right now. After the Titanic was gone and the screams began to die out, that's whenever he started to think about the fate of those of them in the lifeboats. Because we do sometimes forget they did not know 100% that they were going to be rescued in a few hours. And even so, when you're in a little wooden lifeboat drifting in the open North Atlantic cold frigid air in the middle of the night, a few hours can feel like a very long time. And he was thinking to himself, you know, what if we don't get rescued in time? What if we run out of food or water? What if we freeze to death? What if the integrity of the boat is compromised by the cold water temperatures? It just seems like he had all of these different thoughts going through his head about how things could go wrong. And these nervous feelings didn't exactly get any comfort whenever he noticed that the water began to get a little bit more choppy. So throughout the sinking, the, it was known as being like a sea of glass. The ocean water was just so calm and so smooth. And so as they were rowing away from the ship, it was very calm water. Uh, some survivors even said it was like a mill pond. It didn't feel like the ocean at all because of how calm the waters were. But by the time you get to the morning, the water was getting a little bit more choppy it was beginning to get a little bit more noticeable for the people in the lifeboats. And he even said that some of the people in his boat got seasick and they were starting to vomit. For him, he already had experience traveling on boats a lot, as you can imagine. So he was a little bit more immune to the seasickness, but it did affect some people in his boat. He also describes another point in the night where he looks off in the distance and he notices some of the debris from the Titanic floating around in the water. So it just kind of gives him a reminder of what just happened and what he just witnessed. And that, you know, lowered his spirits again, just seeing this debris floating around them. Around seven o'clock that morning, him and the people in their boat ended up seeing an ocean liner steaming towards them. It was the Carpathia. By 8 a.m., about an hour later, they were on board, and it was said that his boat was the last one to be taken on. And this is according to his memoirs. I didn't actually check to see because a lot of survivors thought that their boat was the last one, but nonetheless, that's what he said in his memoirs that he had. Once on board, he took a deep breath, and he was very grateful to have survived, especially when he just saw how many people lost their lives that night. And once he kind of had time to process what happened while he was on the ship, he did say that he shed a couple of tears just thinking about everything that he saw the night before. He said that pretty soon after getting on board, he was given coffee and a warm breakfast pretty hastily. Uh, he did actually make note that the food wasn't that great, but you know, it was still nice to have something warm. And he said that all around the Carpathia was these icebergs everywhere. And it made him a little bit nervous just because, you know, they're surrounded by the very thing that just sank the ship that he was on just the day before. And at one point, he actually says that they saw the iceberg itself that actually sank the Titanic. And there are pictures that were taken from the Carpathia where 
they're supposed to be like red paint at the base of one of these icebergs and so everyone's like that's the one that's the one that must have hit the ship and so he did see the iceberg in his letter he also makes note of how once he was on board and he knew that he was safe again that's whenever he started to think about those unimportant things like oh my goodness I left all of my money behind. I left all of my possessions on the ship. All I have is just this blanket. And even he kind of made a note of how, you know, when your life is in danger, that's the last thing on your mind. But once you're safe again, you kind of begin to start thinking about these unimportant things and just how, oh my goodness, I should have grabbed that or why didn't I get this? Other thing that he mentions is that Apparently, him and some of the other passengers on board the Carpathia, they actually saw a well. You know, I guess somewhere in between all these icebergs and things, they saw like some water spurt up from where a well was, you know, surfacing to get some air. Even though that's not a major detail, I still think that's just one of those little cool things, like reading these letters that people wrote and just getting little details of how things happen in the lifeboats or on the Carpathia after the sinking. Hasono actually ended up getting a robe and some shoes and two warm blankets and he actually slept in the Carpathia's smoking room and that's where he would have stayed until the ship docked and he would have eventually ended up working his way back over to Japan. Once in New York, Hasono actually ended up asking an old friend to help get him home since he lost quite literally everything but the clothes on his back on board the Titanic. And so the friend gave him help and he went to San Francisco first before booking passage on another ship and going to Japan. There was one newspaper that actually heard his story and dubbed him the lucky Japanese boy. And when he first got back to Japan, there was like a little bit of interest in his story about, oh, you know, tell us what happened. He did, I guess, a few local newspaper stories about surviving the Titanic. But what ended up causing some issues for him was another survivor, Colonel Archibald Gracie. He actually wrote a best-selling novel about the Titanic. I'm currently listening to the audiobook about it, and he gives a lot of detail in his stories. And in his book, Colonel Archibald Gracie says that there was a Japanese man who jumped into a lifeboat and hid in there as a stowaway. Now, one of the things about Colonel Archibald Gracie, as I mentioned, his book is very detailed and it gives a lot of specifics about things that happened on the ship and around what time and who said what. But there's definitely some, um, let's just say, old-fashioned undertones in his retelling. He definitely hints that like the white, well-bred male behaved great on the Titanic and everybody else was kind of like uh, a little more barbaric, I guess, or uncouth in the way that they behave. You know what? I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. It was just racist. He said some racist stuff in that book. It definitely gave off like old Southern grandpa type vibes. I I'm trying to find a nice way to beat around it. There just isn't. Not trying to downplay the fact that he survived and he himself went through an amazing ordeal that night. But when I like reading this book or listening to this book, I'm kind of like, mm. so take what he says with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, in 1912, he is a rich white male that survived the Titanic. So, of course, his story is circulating a lot more. And the Empire of Japan, they took this as an embarrassment because, you know, at the time it was all about that Anglo-Saxon mentality of like, be British, oh, they went down doing their duty, you know, that very Edwardian type mentality of how a man is supposed to behave. And now you have this well-respected man writing in his memoirs that, like, the one Japanese passenger on board the Titanic hid away like a coward. And that just didn't look good. So that caused the Empire of Japan to shun Hasona. In fact, his own job actually fired him 
And there were literal textbooks that taught do not be a coward like Masabumi Hasono. Like textbooks. Can y'all believe that? And I just cannot process what this poor man must have felt like. Because not only during the sinking did he have crew members trying to make him go to third class and accusing him of sneaking around the ship when he was in the section that he rightfully paid for access to. But then, after he survives the sinking, he then gets condemned not just by America or, you know, British people that read Colonel Archibald Gracie's story, but now his own country and his own job is churning their backs on him and telling him that he's brought dishonor to himself and his family as well as his entire country. It was even said that there were some newspapers or articles circulating around that he should take his own life. Can you imagine going through survivor's guilt already for surviving a disaster like that and then literally feeling like the entire world is telling you not only that you should have died, but that if you're any type of excuse of a man, then you should take your life as a result of surviving the Titanic. That just blows my mind. And we always talk about how Bruce Ismay was made into a scapegoat, how he was, you know, abused and shunned by society and this poor, poor man that went through all of this. But in my opinion, what Hasono went through must have been far worse. One good thing, I guess, is that his job did in fact end up hiring him back. He was too valuable of an employee for them to just let him go like that. So he did end up getting his job back. But he had to live with that dishonor and that shame for the rest of his life. Matsubumi Hasono ended up dying in his sleep on March the 14th, 1939 at the age of 68. After he died, his wife and his family, they did end up publishing the letter that he wrote to his wife um, in, I think, one of the local newspapers. And then they did it again at some other point, I think, that was around the time that they were looking for the wreck of the Titanic. And it don't seem like it was just getting much attention. But by the time you got to 1997, his grandson decided to release the letter and get his story out to everyone since this new big movie had just came out. So the world was going Titanic crazy over James Cameron's film, and his grandson saw this as the perfect opportunity to reintroduce his story out into the world. And thankfully, 1997 society was way more forgiving and understanding than 1912 society. And his grandson, who is apparently like a leading member of a band called Yellow Magic Orchestra, I think it's like a big band in Japan, um, he actually said that he was happy to see that honor was being brought back to the Hasono name. Even though it was after his death, he did end up finally getting his name cleared in society. I also like that his story is getting told because unfortunately, his story does shine light on some of the racism that people on board the Titanic would have experienced. We touched lightly on that in a video that I did on Joseph LaRoche a while back. And me being someone that loves history, I feel like it's something that shouldn't be sugarcoated, nor is it something that should be, you know, exaggerated. It should be told, the good, the bad, the ugly, and it should be left up to people to come up with their own opinions about these different figures in history. And so having all of the stories told and not just a select few, I think that is the only way that we will ever fully come to understand or wrap our head around what happened on that April night so many years ago. And that is my video on Masabumi Hasono. This was actually a request from someone in my comments if you have a request for somebody's story from the Titanic that you want to hear, by all means, please feel free to comment it below. But in the meantime, be safe and y'all have a good one.